He said, you know, we treated our N-words good. He said, in fact, if I owned you, he pointed to me and he was stepped right up into his face and I said, oh, you would never own me. But it's all the same thing. We're representing something bigger than ourselves. The difference is some people just don't care. They don't want to be a part of that. They don't want to have that responsibility. They want to do whatever they want to do. Suddenly, like you're one of the good Mexicans. I was born in East Los Angeles, uh, born and raised, lived in California for 33 years and moved to Nashville 18 years ago and uh, brought my family's business here. So we're in our studio right now at Delgado Guitars. We're in the music venue, uh, the music maker stage. East LA, I, I mean, look, we grew up in the heart of it. You have a different mentality. You survivor, yeah. you know, survival skills, so to speak. And you don't think of it as like you're living in a very dangerous area. You just are wise. You don't go down certain streets. You don't do dumb things. You, you know what I mean? How did your family get to America? Why did they come here? Mm -hmm. And uh, we can just go from there because this the whole series, this idea of becoming American, I think um, it is strangely uh, divisive in some ways. Uh, who gets to be American? Yeah. People are more American than others and what that looks like. Both on my mom's side and my father's side, it was to provide a better life for their family. And I think anybody who's a parent can relate to that. Um, you know, you'll do things that you didn't think you were going to do, whether good or bad. Um, you know, if it's for to try to improve the lives of your children. And you also have to remember, like back then, crossing the border was not as big of a deal as it is right now. You know, my my father was uh, born in, it lived, grew up in Juarez. So crossing over into El Paso and stuff, like people would go daily and, you know, work there and then come back. And it wasn't like now where, you know, where, you know, they have all these these strict regulations and and I understand things have changed and so forth. But a lot of that is uh, politically fed as well. But just like anything, you know, my grandfather uh, and my great uncle started the business. They eventually moved the business to Juarez in the, the 30s. And then they had an opportunity to come to the United States and do more. And again, you know, that those stories that we don't what we don't realize is travel was not as easy as it is now. And when you left, you left everybody, you know, it wasn't like, hey, honey, pack up the kids. We're going to, you know, that was not everybody's situation. The reality was you were leaving without them. It was a harder life. You know, I even think about it. Look at the pictures of, of our grandparents and stuff like in the 40s and 50s. They're not smiling like all of our, you know, we're all going to be like, hey, when well, we look back at our photos, you know, 30 years from now or our kids when they're our age and they're looking back. And, you know, back then everybody was always so stoic and serious. Um, but it was it was a very different life. But yeah, they came to uh, Los Angeles, my grandfather and great uncle to try to grow the business. Mm -hmm successfully they were able to but they came by themselves in my mom's situation uh it was uh tucson tucson arizona because my grandfather was in mining so that was what made sense they went where there was opportunity they went because even though even still by those standards back then what my grandfather would have earned was far less than what a, a white american would have earned but it was far more than what he was earning in mexico when did they become mexican-american or did that not happen in that generation, do you think? I don't, it didn't happen for my grandfather. Um, it didn't happen for my dad, but friends growing up that their parents wouldn't teach them Spanish because they wanted to make sure that they acclimated to the community and they had experienced different types of prejudice because of their accent, their color of their skin, their language, whatever it was. And if they had little things that they could teach their kids, kind of Americanize them, if you will, then they wanted them to have a better life. We never grew up being ashamed of our roots. It was never like, don't tell anybody you're Mexican. No, it was like, yeah, we're Mexican. We're very proud of it, you know? Um, but you also, I think the experiences were very different from my grandfather, my paternal grandfather and my maternal grandfather. So you have my Papa Pilo, who was building instruments for really well-known clients. So suddenly, 
like you're one of the good Mexicans mm. because you're doing something, uh, producing a product and celebrities and, and, and people are coming to you. So now this is somebody that we would want to associate with. My great uncle made the original Mickey Mouse guitar, the one that was used in the Walt Disney Club. So you talk about being uh, Mexican American, here's uh, Mexican immigrants who come to the United States and they're part of one of the, arguably one of the biggest parts of American folk history Disneyland. Right. <laughs> right. And and so who made it? Two Mexican immigrants, you know, made the original Mickey Mouse guitar. And then fast forward years later, I get a phone call from Pixar. They're working on a film and they need some information and some consulting and they wanted some mariachi instruments. And yeah, so we got to help out a little bit on that movie. Whereas my grandfather on my mom's side was working in a mine. You know, and he was probably treated horribly. You know, I, I don't know that for certain. He died before I was even born, but you know. So I think the experience is very different. And oddly enough, not much of that has changed. I mean, I'm, I'm an American citizen. I was born and raised in the United States. I still tell people I'm Mexican American. My, both my parents are from Mexico. So it's not like I'm having to, you know, search back to figure out where I'm from. I know exactly where my roots are from. I was just fortunate enough that both of them made the effort to come here and, and I'm growing up in the United States, not on the other side of the border. But it's same thing for me, uh, even coming to Nashville, which I love this city and so forth, but it's because I have some type of a name and we've built a business that has a history and something that people are interested in that I'm looked at differently than those men and women that are, you know, cooking or doing the construction or yard work or whatever it might be. I'm no different than they are. No better, no worse, you know. We're the same, right. but because I get to do something really beautiful like this that uh, attracts people's attention, then I, I'm perceived as like one of the good ones. I think it's ignorance and ignorance doesn't mean that somebody is stupid. It means that they lack knowledge in a certain uh, area. So people fear what they don't know. Um, the neighbors across the street from me when we first moved in were afraid of me. And before the one of the daughters had passed away and the, the mother moved away, my kids used to call them auntie and, gran and granny, you know, and I was over there all the time helping them out with stuff. And but and, and that was a decision that I had to make where I, I said, I don't want people to be afraid of me and I don't want to react. If somebody makes a comment and I react, uh, then all I'm going to do is instill whatever that thought that they had of me. They're going to go, oh, yeah. That's, there it is. Yeah, that's who he is. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's like, and it's exhausting to do that. You, you try to build the bridge. And since, you know, when we look at what happened with uh, George Floyd and then suddenly the country awoke and they started wanting to claim, you know, uh, who they were or, or get recognized, yeah. people are kind of tired of having to laugh at the jokes that shouldn't be made in front of them or the comments or different things like that. So a lot, a lot of that has changed. But I think ultimately people want to make sure that they have a place for themselves. Everybody does. Everybody wants to belong. So if you're a part of a culture that feels that you're getting pushed out because other cultures are coming in, then that could be part of it as well. It's, it's just interesting because when I was hearing you say that it's like you're an ambassador, really. Is that how you feel when you're saying you don't want to? Sure. Well, and, and it goes beyond that. So I'm a Christian as well. So I feel like I have a representation of who, how I present myself. I'm representing my Lord. I'm representing my parents, you know, their legacy, what they worked for. Um, I'm out there. If I do something foolish, that could stain my kids, you know. Um, and then they, and when we also raise them with that same idea. So it's knowing that you belong to something bigger than yourself. It, it's having a business name on your you know, and it, this happens to be my business, but if I worked for, you know, ABC one, two, three business, then if I'm out there acting like an idiot while I'm driving around in that company car or that it's the same thing. So, you know, we can look at it in micro uh, uh, examples or we can look at it on bigger scales, but it's all the same thing. We're representing something bigger than ourselves. The difference is some people just don't care. They don't want to be a part of that. They don't want to have that responsibility. They want to do whatever they want to do and so forth. And there is a sense of, um, uh, I don't want to say obligation, but there's a weight that comes to it. But I proudly, you know, I I'm proud to do that. I'm proud to make sure that I'm out there and I'm doing stuff that I hope represents my culture well. <laughs> uh oh, he, that's what he was wanting. Oh, I 
I yeah. love it. I love it. What's his name? Oreo. Oreo. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But you know, oddly enough, the same thing has happened in on the opposite where I've had people who are from Mexico mm. that are here now and they're here legally and they're and and I'm not Mexican enough. Yeah. A lot for my friends who are black. Yeah. You know, well, I was, yeah. wasn't, I'm not black enough because yeah. if they have one parent that's not black or they're lighter skin or they didn't grow up and, you know, right. in the hood or whatever, it's like, you know, it's like yeah. it's like you have to check off oh, certain yeah. boxes. So so we see it not only from other cultures. Uh, but we even see it sometimes within our own culture. So you were saying you were raised as, you know, Mexican heritage. How did you feel as a child about your identity? So my parents uh, um, raised us to be very uh, confident in who we were. Um, we had two loving parents, which can make the world a difference. It was like, I grew up in Los Angeles, so it was like this pish posh. I had friends that were from Samoa, friends, that, you know, born here, but again, of that right. descent, Filipino. Um, you know, so it was just like a melting pot. We embraced each other's differences. We, we would joke about them. We would laugh about them, but we also wanted to like experience those things. I wish so, that, that was the whole experience though. See, when I think about the ideal of America, that's what I want for my kids. I want them to be very aware, not of the differences, but of where they come from. And mm -hmm. still like, that's not going to be a barrier to any relationship for your daughters. Cause you're a dad, you have daughters. What is the America that they're growing up into right now? I think now it's just very polarized. We have uh, everything's become political. Um, the best that Julie and I try to do for our kids is raising them, knowing where their history comes from and having them be proud of that. And even to the point where not allowing other people to make fun of it. But but you do it in a way, again, with where it's not about reacting. Mm -hmm. It's not like, hey, if somebody makes a Mexican joke, you, you know, punch them in the face or you tell them this or no, no, no. You just, you know, you show how proud you are that you have history like that, that you have, you know, roots that, you know, go back into a different co country that, you know, your your father and your grandfather and your great grandfather built instruments for these people. You had a you know, a, a grandmother and a grandfather who worked in a mine and your grand, you know what I mean? Like, so it's like showing them the value of that history. A lot of the younger kids now more aware of uh, acceptance mm. to other people. We have this generation that could be, you know, my generation, maybe the generation below it, certainly the generations above it, where it's all about defining who someone is and everybody's got to be in their place and so forth. And a lot of the younger people now are, it's more about accepting one another. So I think, although we are dealing with this, you know, red and blue, everything is red and blue. Um, there's another side of that where this generation that's coming up is going to help to combat that. And I think we're going to see some changes. The way to do things about this is to start having conversations like this one. So I yeah. really appreciate you doing this with me and just talking. I think mm -hmm. the more times we can get people just talking and, and normalizing, it's okay to just sit down and talk about this stuff. Will you tell me about a time, maybe as an adult even, where there was that tension between being of Mexican ancestry and being an American and maybe even having to do what you're saying, not, not punch someone in the nose, um, but will you tell me about an instance where you had to figure out how to respond to something and yeah. what you did? Well, unfortunately, uh, when I moved to Tennessee, there were more than not, you know, it was more of them than I care to remember. Um, one that came comes to mind, is there was a time when, it was actually when Trump was running for office. And one of my neighbors over here had called me and asked me if I could help them unload some four by eight foot uh, sheets of plywood. They're pretty heavy. So we're unloading these sheets and the driver was a white male from I think he was from Alabama or something like that and he started talking about he was very it was very obvious he was part of some kind of a white uh, national uh, you know like he was yeah it was just like scary history that he was re you know reciting that wasn't accurate it was told from a different lens and then talked about when he was in the service that his grandmother told him to be nice to those n-words because you're going to need something to shoot at when you come back. Yeah, this is, yeah. And then, and then he, I this remember. This is three years ago. This is three years ago. Yeah. And I remember at one point in the conversation, he said, you know, we treated our N-words good. He said, in fact, if I owned you, he pointed to me and he was, <laughs> he, 
And I just about lost it. I just stepped right up into his face and I said, oh, you would never own me, <laughs> you know. But oh, so, wow. yeah, you know, that that's just, yeah, just three, four years ago. I, I do feel like that election was a time where I look back as like something broke in our country, something broke. And I feel like it wasn't just along racial lines, but but it's it's there. It's a thing I don't remember growing up with as right. a child because I grew up in New York, um, a pretty diverse area. It never even occurred to me to yeah. it, it just this seemed like a bygone era. But now here it is again. Um, how does this how does this stuff bubble up again? Do you think? Do you think people have just been kind of holding these things in? Is this a new thing that has been reintroduced? This I, this I don't want to use the word racism because I feel like it's just so cliche. But like these mindsets of quantifying where well, the hierarchy of like these people are here these people are here and these guys are down here has this just been percolating do you think do you think something is new I, it's not new i mean talk to anybody i mean especially if if you're black you know um this is nothing new you know they've been experiencing this their whole lives you know i i've it was amazing that i realized um how much I had tolerated after, like I said, after the George Floyd and all of that started to kind of come to light, like the comments that I would let people say or the things. And I got to a point where I was just like, no more, I'm done. And it didn't mean that I had to, you know, combat it in a negative way, but it was like, you know, that's not funny or that's not okay to say, or, you know, um, but so I, I don't think it's anything new. Um, I agree. A lot of times people are going to make, and it's funny, people will make the assumption also that I'm very conservative. Mm -hmm. I'm very conservative. You know, uh, I mean, if I told you my, my voting past, it, you know, I've voted for both parties. Yes. Um, it's, you know, but you're right. Um, immediately people want to assume, oh, that guy's a left wing liberal or, you know, vice versa, or whatever. What I always have tried to do is I, I say if I'm in the if I'm able to be in the other person's shoes, and uh, my father-in-law says you should walk a mile in another person's shoes because then you're a mile away from them and you have your <laughs> shoes and you have their shoes. <laughs> but um, but if I'm able to put myself in in their shoes and try as best I can is to look at it from their viewpoint. I can at least have some kind of empathy or try to find some kind of common ground where maybe we can start a conversation. So even if somebody is looking at me, telling me, go back where I came from, blah, blah, blah. If I can stop and go, where is this person coming from? They don't even know who I am. They don't know that my father was a Vietnam veteran, you know, that he fought for our country. They don't know that, you know, uh, we have did something for the victims of 9-11. They don't, whatever it might be, you know what I mean? Like you can list it. They don't know these things. They're just making an assumption based off of this, you know, uh, or because I'm wearing a T-shirt that where it says a certain thing or a hat that's a certain color or whatever it is. Now, part of that is is the responsibility of that. If I'm going to walk around with a MAGA hat, then I have to make an uh, I have to I'm doing that because I want people to say I want them to know this is what I stand for. Right. Everything that comes with that. Right. So. But if I could see a person with a MAGA hat mm -hmm. and I and I go, you know what? There's more to that person than that hat. Mm -hmm. OK. And even though I, you know, I don't agree with those politics, but I bet that's a good person in there. And if I get a chance to talk to them and if they're willing to talk to me and, and not not get into the political stuff, you know, like, let's find. Hey, where are you from? Do You have any kids? You know, what did you what do you do? Are you you know? And then suddenly you start to break all those things away. It's not, it's our, if it's your neighbor, that's so much different than seeing someone as part of a group that you, that you disagree with. Yeah. And um, where do you think the healing can come in? So, you know, I'm a Christian too, right? So yeah. we share that, but not everybody is, but we still, I think all have, most of us have that same goal of wanting to live in a place where we, we care about our neighbor and your neighbor cares about you. And there's just this feeling of we are all American. I don't feel like we all see each other as American, yeah. um, even though if you born in the United States, still not American enough. I don't know. Right. Well, I think one, we have to stop letting uh, politicians divide us and the news media, you know, that's bad. There's, yeah. <laughs> that's bad. So I think whether you're on the Fox 
you know, one network or whatever, or whether you're on the MSNBC or, you know, the CNN, uh, you know, they're, they're very leaning to one way or the other. And it's like social media. Social media is not going, hey, Daniel, come look at a couple of pictures and then stop what you're doing and go back to your day and <laughs> put the phone down. No, they want to suck you in and they want you to keep on there scrolling, 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 scrolling. They've already shown how bad it is for kids, all that kind yeah. of stuff. The news media is doing the same thing. They figured out a long time ago, hey, we can make more money if we can, you know, feed on people's fears and, 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 and have them buy into this narrative. And there's no longer news. We're not getting news anymore. So one, turn, turn that off, you know, uh, start talking to one another, start realizing that we're really better and we're stronger if we're somehow, you know, we're called the United States. We're supposed to be united. If we could, if we could come together as a people, and start to fight some of these systems, you know, where you have lifelong politicians, they're secretly giving themselves raises, they're doing everything for them, they don't care about us. You know, there's a few good ones that are in there, you know what I mean, but not on, on both sides, they're, you know. I agree. Yeah. But I think, I think a lot of it is just stopping and looking to one another and realizing that, you know, at the end of the day, that person that you just set up bob wire and flotation devices so that somebody jumps in that lake to come across is going to get demolished. Now, that person is trying to create a better life for their kids. And if you can look at what they're trying to do, the, way, the method about them, the way, how they're going about it is wrong. We can agree on that. We can agree that crossing the border illegally is illegal. Okay? But to demonize these people, or even like we, you know, we say the term Christian, that's not a popular term mm -hmm. because people will automatically assume that, oh, he's one of those types of Christian. Well, there's so many different people that use that term Christian that don't live the way God intended for us to live. You know, we're supposed to love one another. We're not supposed to judge. Jesus hung out with all the riffraff. That's why I think he likes me. You know what I mean? It's like, cause you know what I mean? It's oh, like, okay. he, he didn't hang out with the politicians and the wealthy and this or that, you know? So our, we raise our children. We say, if you're going to make an error, make the error of over loving somebody rather than over judging somebody, you know? And I don't know all the answers. We're going to do the best we can to try to figure out whether this is right or wrong or whatever, but we're not supposed to just go around and point at people and tell them you're doing wrong. You're going to go to hell. You're going to this, you're going to that. No, lead by example, love them. You know, I think my God is strong enough that he doesn't need me to turn people's hearts, but I am supposed to live a life and not be ashamed of where I come from. Absolutely. You know, whether that's my faith or my history or my heritage. Absolutely. And I, I do a lot of times on the channel, I'll come back to the same phrase of just like, you know, just loving your neighbor, loving mm -hmm. your neighbor. And it seems like we truly cannot even love our physical neighbors. Like right. we're in the store, people are breaking out in fights, people are on planes, they're breaking out in fights. And I just feel like I've had it. Like mm -hmm. I, don't, I can't, I, I just, I reject this. I just, I don't feel, I don't feel like it's too far gone, but um, I think we do need to start addressing why are we here? Because yeah. that's, that you can't, we can't heal things unless we, we pull out what's there. Mm -hmm. And there's some stuff there that still needs to get pulled out. We're, we're here together to try to create a better world, whether it's here in, in Nashville, in the city, whether it's through the state of Tennessee and then in the greater country, you know, for good. It's not, you know, you're an American if you're, were born here because people can become, United, right. you know, can become citizens. Um, but I think what, what my, I think of Americans as people who are, uh, you know, we're like the volunteer state, people who are willing to sacrifice for their family, for their neighbor, um, and, and I know we're a, a nation of many different faiths and cultures, but I think to me, I go back to like that, that, uh, Christian base of, again, loving your neighbor, caring for your neighbor. I think that's who I've always imagined like Americans. One of the greatest experiences I've had is, um, through some of the harshest tragedies that our city has gone through, whether it's the flood or the tornado, you know, I was side by side with people that, we would not, other, not otherwise be swinging a hammer together. And we were there because we both wanted, you know, or collectively the peep group that were there, we wanted to do something better for our neighborhood, for our, for our friends. That's what I think an American is. Not, you know, so proud of the uh, blue and red stripes that everybody else is stupid, every other country is wrong, every other, you know what I mean? Definitely proud of who we are, definitely proud of our country. I cry at the national anthem. I really do. It's like, 
we have we have the world's i think we still have one of the greatest you know nations in the world but do we do everything perfectly of course not you know we have a lot of mistakes that we've done we've had history that is not very flattering but we need to learn from that and grow from that i love the visual because we were here for the flood we were here for the tornado and you're right the community coming together you know, it's too bad because it, it, I feel like it reminds me a little bit of September 11th. We were talking mm -hmm. about this in the car because I know you guys did the Unity guitar. And I, I want to yeah. hear a little bit about that because I feel like that's even on a bigger scale, which I, I hate that it is, sometimes takes a tragedy for us to swing the hammer with right. our neighbor. It was terrifying and terrible, but also really beautiful because it was time where just everybody just kind of was locking arms. Yeah. Right? Um, can you tell me about, as a Mexican-American, mm -hmm. you, you, I want to hear about the guitar, but just kind of... Um, what it meant to you, I guess, to be a part of that. You're representing America, really. Oh, with the Unity yes. guitar? Yeah. Oh, well, it was, I mean, I, I, it really was a God-inspired thing. So I remember getting a phone call from my friend. Uh, Julie and I had been married not quite a year or about a year um, and said, hey, turn on the news. And it, you know, were you in New York? Yeah. Okay. And not so, the city, but we were in the. Yeah, area. but yeah. but you, yeah, you were there where it happened yeah. first. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're seeing everything, and everything was happening at nine a.m. That's right. So we're two hours, or well, three hours behind you, you know, depending on whatever, whatever the the. So we're we're watching this, and I remember driving into East L.A. and because uh, we were living just outside in the L.A. County, uh, my wife and I driving into L.A. for work. We opened the shop at nine. The, nobody on the freeway. This is L.A., That's mind so you. Freaky. Yeah, <laughs> that alone would scare the heck out of you, right? That nobody's on the freeway. It's like, what happened here? And then I remember looking up at the sky and not seeing any planes or anything because we were wondering if we were going to be next. And on the way home, I remember I called in and I talked to Ryan Seacrest on the Did you? on the yeah on the radio because wow. he was doing this really great thing about like you know trying to make sense of it all and yeah. people and it was kind of like just saying you know like hey we're all you know we're all in this together type thing. And uh, that, that weekend uh, or a few days after our church had an event where we came and I still have it at the house. Everybody had a name that they would pray for. And I got one of the little girls that had died on one of the planes, the one that went into the Pentagon. And so we were all praying for somebody. And, um, and I started thinking, Lord, what can I do? Because, you know, to give blood, give money, all those things are great. But I felt like I was being uh, compelled to do something more that was more personal. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was building an instrument. Mm -hmm. So because that's what I did. Mm -hmm. So then I got the idea of, well, let's do this in a way where it, it represents um, a unity. So what? Well, let's use wood from different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, OK, let's get different artists from different genres to be involved. So. You know, we got Smokey Robinson and Los Lobos and Tigres del Norte and, you know, Vicente Fernandez and the Dixie Chicks and Earl Scruggs and, you know, Mary J. Blige. And I mean, so it's like, how more diverse can you get than all that? And the one thing that I noticed was a lot of the undocumented victims, and this is not just Latinos, yeah. the undocumented victims of 9-11, their families couldn't get any information about them because the owners of the businesses in the World Trade Center were afraid of being sanctioned for hiring undocumented victims. Um, so they they just acted like I don't know who, who I don't know if that person worked here. They knew they did, but they weren't going to admit it because then there would be penalties for that. In that moment, when we're dealing with this tragedy, companies were going through that or they were making that decision to not give information to their families. So that's when I said, "Well, let's do this instrument and let's try to raise money for the undocumented victims of 9/11." And that was what the money went to. And it was it went to an organization in New York City. Asociación Tepeyac was what it was called. And we gave the money to them. And then we ended up flying four families from New York to, to Los Angeles that had lost somebody in the World Trade Center. And I remember I got there like at 3 o'clock in the morning. We're setting up stages on Cesar Chavez. And we're doing you know everything to get ready. And it was there was a lot of tension going on. There was other, all this other stuff happening. And I was just trying to get through the day and get through the event. And a friend of mine, Eleanor Vega, who used to be the evening producer for the Dan Rather News, uh, was helping us put this, at, I mean, pretty much single-handedly helped us organize this whole thing. She was amazing. At one point, she grabs me and she says, Manuel, I need you to come in here. And I'm thinking, Eleanor, I'm busy. I got to, you know, I got to get this done. I got, come on, come on. She pulls me in and shuts the door and I'm standing there and there's like five or six people 
and I'm standing there and I'm looking and they all have on the shirt from the event that we're having, you know, unity event. And she says, this are the families of, from the victims of 9-11. And I just lost it. I feel like I And they did too. Yeah. yeah. We just like, all, I mean, literally it wasn't like, hi, how are you? We just, <laughs> I started crying. They were, might've already been, or they stay, and we just all hugged. I don't remember anything that we talked about. I don't, re- I know we talked, I was in there for a while. But that was that was what I needed to remember. That's literally if I sit back and I, that's all I remember. I just remember that moment. It's that love low for each other. And I yeah. think it's like it doesn't even really matter at the end of the day what the words were exchanged. The feelings like you loved. Exactly. And they were receiving that from you. Yeah. And like that's what else can we do? Yeah. That's the most we can do. Yeah. Oh, I love that. It was amazing. So I thank you so much for having the, like the conversation, just sharing this with me. I think it's important to look back in history. I think some people say, you got to keep looking forward. And I'm like, no, we got we to look backward and we got to take notes. That's how you to... learn. Yeah, we're here trying to continue the legacy that my grandfather and my father uh, have passed down to me. 